podcast. This is Mrs. Valverde. Um, today we're going to be going over cell signals and there's a lot of different types of cell signals and a lot of them are involved in the immune system responses for organisms and the nervous system for any organism that has a nervous system. So let's start off with a basic cell system response and this was first figured out by Earl Sutherland and he was working with epinephrine. So basically what happens is we have three steps. We have reception, transduction, and the response, right? So the reception is there's a signal outside of the cell, and there's a receptor protein that's in the cell membrane that binds to it. This is called the receptor, and this is called the ligand or the signal, okay? So once that binding happens, reception is complete, okay? Sometimes an, a new molecule will be entering into the cell as part of a package to send information, but sometimes just that binding will cause molecules to be released or, and signal to the nucleus of the cell. So the second step is what happens next, the transduction. Um, it's how that signal is converted inside the cell. So it's what's going to happen inside the cell now. So how the, the message gets relayed. The last step is response. And this is the actual activity. Usually the activity that's triggered in the cell has something to do with a protein that's going to be produced or the decrease in production of a protein. And there's a couple of different types of reception. right? So here's one type of reception. Um, this is a couple G protein receptor. So if we look at a broader view of what's going on here, there's a sp particular shape to the recepting site that will bond to different molecules. The G protein responds to one particular um, ligand, right? It's called a G protein because it's using GTP, as you can see over here. It looks a lot like your ATP conversion. It is guanosine triphosphate, so like ATP is adenosine triphosphate. This is guanosine triphosphate. All right, so we have this protein complex that's in the cell membrane. There's going to be a signal, the ligand's going to come in and bond, right? And there's actually a, a G protein that's going to help to transmit this signal over to an enzyme that does the cell response, right? So this is like a two-step cell membrane process that happens in here it's using guanosine triphosphate, right? And having the G protein help out is a big part of this process. The next type... Um, is tyrosine kinase receptor, right? And what's unique about this is that it can cause multiple types of cell responses, right? So it's not just for one cell response, it could be for more than one. So a signal comes in and there's this particular shape on the receptor again, particular shape to the ligand that bonds together. Those two uh, receptors will now bind together and a dimer just means that it's making a reflection of uh, identical molecule. All right, so dimer just means that they're um, they're mirrored on both sides. Okay, this is using ATP to produce the full response, and then you get the cell response within the cell for the next two steps. All right, the last ones um, for smaller molecules for smaller signals. Right, and this is the ligand gated ion channels. So we've talked about ions moving in and out of ion channels. Um, this is a big part of neuron uh, cell signaling. So this is just like you can have a, a nice strong positive charge outside the cell and then a negative charge inside the cell is signaling the cell to change something to cause a cell response. All right, and sometimes that's just a problem outside of the cell such as what we did with the allodia. Um, if you put it in salt water, it'll shrivel up. But also just having um, some more cations, positive charges outside could just signal a cell to respond differently, to do some kind of activity, produce proteins differently. Right? So we have different ways in which cells want to communicate. They could want to communicate with cells that are nearby, cells that are connected to one another, cells that are in completely different organisms. All right? So these are two different cells of yeast. They're whole organisms on their own. All right? The signal that they're sending to one another is to exchange genetic material. All right? So they're sending these signals saying that, like, I have this genetic material. And this one's saying, I have this genetic material. And they're like, well, if we get together, we could exchange some genetic material. 
and they do. They get together and they exchange genetic material, and then this cell will split, and the two new cells will have different genetic material because the, um, the material's been switched around. Right. You also have cells of multicellular organisms. So here this is multicellular, this could be like animal cells, um, skin tissue cells that allow some gap junctions, so some movement, easy movement of stimulating molecules outside of the cells. All right. If it's happening within a plant cell, um, it can move between what's called plasmodesmata. So we have these, these porous areas where cell signals can be transmitted. Right? And then outside of the cell, the cell membrane is the, the most common one, the cell junctions where they're actually sending signals through the, um, the receptors can connect and send to those, uh, those external proteins. Right? Um, there's local signaling, so all of those signal pathways can be with cells that are in a local close range. That's called paracrine, so it's it's close range cell communication. Um, and another form of close range cell communication is what happens with neurons, a synaptic signal where there's not an actual connection between the cells. There's a little bit of space, so there's a, a sending of uh, ligands and then a reception of ligands and there's a, a gap of space between them where that signal is being sent to. Right? And to look at that a little more closely, okay, let me just move this down a bit. Okay, This is an actual animation I promised I'd show you guys of the synapse. A chemical synapse is a special junction between two neurons that allows them to communicate without being physically connected. A synapse has several structures. The presynaptic neuron ends in a small bulb called the presynaptic terminal. The postsynaptic terminal membrane is directly adjacent, separated by a small space called the synaptic cleft. An action potential causes voltage-gated calcium ion channels to open in the presynaptic terminal. The influx of calcium ions prompts synaptic vesicles to release neurotransmitters via exocytosis. This neuron is releasing acetylcholine. The neurotransmitter quickly diffuses across the synaptic cleft. Two acetylcholine molecules bind with one ligand-gated sodium channel at the postsynaptic membrane, opening the channel. When enough sodium ion channels open, the postsynaptic cell depolarizes and the action potential continues along the neuron. All right, so acetylcholine is actually a, a pretty good example to use. That molecule um, stimulates uh, motor neurons, so it'll still stimulate any kind of muscle movement. Uh, so when somebody has botulism, say something that causes them to be paralyzed, then those synaptic terminals that are m using the neuromorin, the acetylcholine, is not being released. It's decreased drastically, so then muscles won't move, they're paralyzed. All right, so looking a little bit closer at, uh, at a neuron, and you guys have already done this with the Bozeman video, but if we look at the breakdown of the neuron, we basically have the major cell body, and then we have all of these branching, these are all like little antennas, these dendrites, that are going to receive signals. So just think of those as all like antennas outside trying to get a, a signal, right? And then the axon is where they can send a signal. So a signal comes in from the dendrites, it goes out through the axon. Right? Around here, this myelin sheath, what that is, is that's a whole bunch of fat covering up the, the pathway for the signal to go. All right? And the signal is moving as both a chemical signal, which is the movement of the cations that are going to be sent down, and it's also an electrical um, signal. So that's why it, um, you can you could stimulate the brain with electricity, you could stimulate the body with electricity because neurons communicate with electricity and with a chemical pathway. Right? This is a animate, uh, another animated view of it. So here's, here's a cell that's releasing, this is a receptor, so here we're sending out the signal. There's an actual space here, the space is the synaptic cleft where the um, information is going to be received into some dendrite or into the actual cell. Other than close range, so this is all close range, but when 
when the neurons need to communicate in a further range, right? So this will all happen between neurons in the central nervous system, the CNS, right? And that's where your brain is, your cranium essentially, and the stem of the brain. Um, but there's also the peripheral nervous system. So we have senses in our fingers, we have senses, um, neurons in our toes, we have neurons that connect and stimulate muscles. So if a, the body needs to get a signal from the brain to the rest of the body, what it'll do is it'll signal neurons to work with the endocrine system. And that's, the, where, that's where all the hormones are coming from. So essentially a neuron has to tell the endocrine system to release this message through the bloodstream and then it's going to send that message to a different part of the body. All right. um, the different type of neurons that there are is the sensory neuron. All right, And the sensory neuron is the one that's going to send out information, give information. A sensory receptor, which is the one that's going to receive information. Um, the interneuron is a neuron that is going to connect to a motor neuron, so it's getting the information from, uh, from a sensory neuron and giving it to a motor neuron. And then there's a motor neuron that is connecting directly to either glands or to muscles. So up near the head, it can connect to, say, the pituitary gland, saying to release more thyroid hormone, right? And then once the thyroid hormone is released, um, the body and tension in the body that builds up if you have low thyroid levels will release when the um, when the motor neuron receives that information. All right, a whole bundle of neurons together is called a nerve. So if you've heard of the nerve endings or the, the optic nerve inside your eye that receives image information, that's a whole bundle of neurons. All right, so this is... This is still all part of our just receiving information. So the second pathway um, is the transduction. All right, so transduction is a lot of chemical changes that are going to occur. And this, this process of chemical changes is called the phosphorylation cascade. Phosphorylation cascade is this ability for the cell to either amplify the signal that it received. So we could say this could say um, make a whole bunch of mitochondrial proteins, right? And over here it's like, okay, make a whole bunch of mitochondrial proteins, make a whole bunch more mitochondrial proteins. And that can continue on to really amplify and, and make that signal stronger and stronger and build up in the cell. And if it's built up in the cell, um, making it a large response, it's protein kinase that would be active there, right? If it was slowing it down, though, in order to make it not such a strong signal, the opposite would be phosphatases, all right? So phosphatases are not on here, but they would be slowing down and limiting the signal reaction, all right? They're, they're essentially turning it off, okay? And smaller signals, so this would be like for a large molecule that's received via your G protein or your tyrosine kinase receptors. But if you had the ligand gated ion channels, those are for smaller signals. So other signals that can come in could be your cations like calcium, a positive calcium ion, which is what neurons use a lot of times. And there's also the, the cyclin amp, which would be another smaller ionic um, signal. All right, so here's here's essentially what it would look like with a G protein. So this is the second step again, the transduction step happening. So you could see that um, there is going to be energy, there is going to be uh, a signal. This signal is not going to be as strong as the phosphorylation cascade. So this one cannot be amplified or changed around. Right. And once that signal is received, the last step is going to be the response. So this is where information is going to be sent. The nucleus is going to activate a particular gene to either make more of a protein or slow down the production of a protein in response to that. Here's a nice overview. You can pause the video at any time. So if you like looking at this, you could see the... Um, if you like looking at this, if this is a helpful diagram for you, um, you can see the phosphorylation cascade happening here. All right, and it's a multi-step process. All right, you should have a general idea. So you should know what the protein kinase is doing, and you should 
know what the phosphatases would be doing in this process. And essentially this is just, it's making the, the message readable. So it's kind of like this message was sent out in Morse code and then the message has to be translated from Morse code into our regular alphabet so we understand what the heck is going on here. All right? And then it's like, oh, this is what it's telling us to do, make this. All right, and then this is where it gets into the nucleus and it says make that, all right? So this is the steps broken down. So we have our actual, so here's testosterone. There would be a nice, a nice signal coming in, all right? Signals received, all right? Um, it's going to be transducted. The response is going to happen in the nucleus, mRNA, so transcription, translation is going to happen, and we make a new protein in response, okay? So, sorry. So this is the brief overview, right? This would be the um, the signal to make a change. So these are showing you actual cells that have been exposed to a signal for them to actually change. And this is a process of them changing, um, right? And this is showing you other types of cell signal and other types of response. So this would be um, my actin filaments this has to do with like muscular changes so this would be like a, a motor uh, like a muscular movement okay and another alteration that can happen to a signal here is that you can if you're receiving different signals into a cell then maybe it takes more than one signal for the cell to actually respond to something. So in the, the Bonnie Bassler, the bacteria video that you guys already watched, you know that bacterium are constantly sending out these ligand signals and they're telling each other what kind of bacteria is present. And sometimes it takes more than one type to uh, activate a response. And that's what you see here. Okay, and the last thing that I want to go over is the immune system response, right? So here's an example of an immune response, and I think the Bozeman did a really good job. So this is like an overview of what's going on here. We have some kind of um, invader, okay? And they're showing you this like nice little bacterium. Here's our invader, okay? And here's Here's are going to be our T cell coming in to do some work. This is our helper T cell, which is giving it the information it needs. So it's saying, this is how you kill that bacteria right there, right? And, um, and then this, is, this would be the process. So signal is sending out, like, oh, we successfully killed this bacteria. We did phagocytosis. We consumed the bacterium. And the information of how to kill that bacterium is now saying this is how we are going to build more helper T cells to take this attack onto the bacterium. All right, um, it's B or T cells that are part of the immune system. The B cells are coming from the left, um, the bone marrow, and T cells come from the thymus, which is a gland that's um, that's near your thyroid. It's it's just down your trachea, under your collarbone. And that gland's really active when you're young, like five years old-ish. Um, and then it's not so active when you're an adult. All right. Um, so you have a limited amount of T cells. And that's why a disease that uses your T cells they, um, against you, such as an autoimmune disease like AIDS, like autoimmune um, disorder, uh, deficiency syndrome, AIDS, then you will end up having a big problem with being able to fight anything because all of your T cells, your limited amount of them, have now been used to attack your body. Uh, lupus does that also. So um, the effector, which is not on here, is essentially what's producing the specific antigen. All right, so this is the information to kill that bacterium, that little piece of orange there that's over here now. Okay, so it's, it's calling it the peptide antigen. You could also call that the effector. The memory cell is a type of um, immune cell that is going to live a long time, and it's storing all the information about all these bacteria to give to helper T cells if they ever need it. So it's like, I know how to kill this kind of bacteria, that kind of bacteria. It's like the library of how to kill bacteria. All right, so this is, this is our overview of cell signaling. If you have questions, please email me, um, and you're responsible for the information in this slideshow, the Bozeman and the Packets, for our upcoming quiz. Thank you.